The biggest problem with the soft landing idea is essentially that after suffering some major setbacks and imbalances the last couple of years, the U.S. and really the rest of the world aren't in a position to start suddenly stabilizing and growing at a steady rate again. Think about it this way. How many families have been left further and further behind by just consumer prices? As we hear all the time, consumer prices have grown much faster and farther than wages have. Now, the top end of the economic spectrum, they've done pretty well. In fact, they've done really well if you own stocks too. But too many people have been left out of that those, those gains, any kind of economic or financial gains. Instead, as consumer prices continue to bite, as oil prices go up for non-economic reasons, it leads them to even worse circumstances. But despite the fact that this has been developing for several years, we're only now beginning to see emerge some of the stress and strains that are associated with that kind of economic dysfunction and distortion. For an example, the Philadelphia Fed just recently put out a report on the, the fourth quarter of 2023 suggesting that credit card delinquencies and really mortgage originations are starting to show real cracks in the, in the basis of the, what we think of as the U.S. economy. I'll read you from what the Philly Fed report said. Credit card performance further deteriorated at the end of 2023, with firms recording the worst 30, 60, and 90-day account-based days, days past due levels in the reporting series. Notably, card performance usually declines in the fourth quarter. However, stress among cardholders was further underscored in the payment behavior as the share of accounts making minimum payments rose 34 basis points to a series high from last quarter's reading. Now their data goes back only to 2012, so we don't have we don't have information on prior cycles, but we know from other series that this is typical behavior in the early stages of an economic setback. So that's another big problem that some people have with the idea that the economy is in rough shape. In addition to major economic accounts like GDP and the payroll numbers, we've been talking about weakness for a very long time. So as far as most people are concerned, this is done, this is over. We went through the soft patch and we've worked our way through it. So Steve, Steve Van Meter, help me out here. Because when we look at some of these things, we put all these things together. First of all, you know, can you really have a a really good economic situation developed from what we just what we just went through the last couple of years. Not only did we lose a lot of stuff in the lockdowns, a lot of businesses closed. Even those who managed to have been employed and remained employed over the last couple of years, they've got the problems of these price imbalances. We're never going to get that purchasing power back. So how can we possibly achieve not only a soft landing but a robust economy from here going forward? You know, Jeff, that's a great point because, you know, I'm at a baseball game today for a very, very good reason. You know, we look at the equity markets, we look at what sentiment surveys are saying, at least from consumers, and they're telling us, look, hey, we're in the seventh, eighth inning of this cycle. The end is almost here and we're about to start a whole new game, a new bull market, a great new economy, the soft landing. It's been achieved. You know, we hear from Fed Chair Powell and, you know, you start looking at these delinquency rates and, you know, we start to make the case, Jeff, of this is perhaps the first few innings of the game still. And yet people look back and say, well, no, this has been going on for years. How can you guys make such a claim? But maybe the game had a lot of commercial breaks. It's just been moving very slowly. But that's the issue here is this rise in delinquencies, which we then also saw in the JP Morgan data. They reported earnings today. And what did they say? Their charge off rate is rising. Now, these are things that usually have and in the early stages of going into recession, not the late stages. So Jeff, for me, this is all a dangerous sign that the worst is far yet to come. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said, uh, maybe not today, but there's a lot to be said about why this has taken so long to develop. It's like, like you said, Steve, there's a lot of commercials in the first inning because there's been a lot of foul balls or something, you know, these at-bats are taking forever. Um, and most people have just, they've lost interest in the idea that there's going to be a downturn. First of all, from their sense of the economy, they can't see any sort of confirmation that the situation is weak. We've been waiting for the payroll reports to reflect some kind of weakness, and they just won't. GDP is still robust and sterling. So it really does seem like from the surface that there's really nothing to be worried about. However, 
if you're in the situation where you start to see, uh, you know, income data weaken, some of the other labor market statistics weaken, plus realizing that what may have really stretched out the cycle this time is all of that government interference over the last couple of years, it does begin to make sense that makes sense that uh, only more recently do we start to see these signs of deterioration, more significant deterioration. We've already seen signs of deterioration that just haven't broken out into the open. But now we're getting into some more of the fundamental, more consistent numbers that we see with every recession, like delinquencies and credit cards and other forms of credit. So it's as hard as it may be to believe, you have to think, you know, start just from a very simple common sense basis. How can the economy be in such good shape after going through everything that we just went through and so many people struggling, really struggling? I mean, you look around. How many people do you know that are actually struggling? How many people do you know that are actually not struggling? It's a big proportion. And so how can we have an economy that's ready to take off if that's the place from which we're starting from? And when we say we're in the early innings, what we mean is there has to be a reckoning. There has to be a working out of these imbalances. You know, Jeff, that's an interesting point, because if you take the pandemic out of this, and we know, of course, there's a lot of money, and I don't want to take the pandemic itself away, but you look at the money flow that was created by all the borrowing and all the stimulus, and you start to now put this in frame of where we are in the game. Remember, there was a Fed report that came out last year that said somewhere around the end of the third quarter, they really felt that the pandemic stimulus would be completely exhausted from the system. So if we say that that number is correct, and obviously there's going to be some tolerance in a matter of months on either side of that, when we look at this you know, Philly Fed report and see an increase in credit card delinquencies, and you say the game started when we ran out of pandemic money, well, all of a sudden now you get a whole different picture because what a lot of people don't understand is what we should be seeing is a peak in credit card delinquencies. We should be rate, see rates coming down. And then that would indicate that, of course, the delinquency rate is going to start to come off. And we're not seeing that. We're seeing the beginning phases, which lines up perfectly with the Fed's belief that indeed we ran out of money somewhere around the third quarter, maybe early in the fourth quarter. And now we're starting to see that effect. Of course, the data here being a little lagged, but it all starts to line up that we are indeed in the beginning of this game at a time, unfortunately, Jeff, where so many people have taken a lot of risk because they've been watching the game before the game. That's what we're missing here is there was a pregame, a warm up, and everyone thought it was a real thing. Yeah, I think that was a big, I mean, it's easy to understand why that happened because, um, you know, this is such a unique set of circumstances that we've never really confronted before. This is very different than really anything going back to the 1950s. You can't really use the 1970s as an analogy here because it wasn't the same type of behavior. I mean, there, there were some similarities in 1973, 74 with the oil shock, but in 73, 74, you already had almost a decade of actual inflation before we ever got that far. And then, of course, 1979 oil shock, we had 15 years of underlying inflation, which we don't have this time around. So to really, I mean, no, no, one's, no one in, uh, has a living memory of the last time we went through something like this. And it presents all sorts of unique challenges just on that account. And, in, and then you have to factor in all the idiosyncrasies and differences that have happened over the last couple of years that are that are unique in history, the pandemic and the, and the aftermath, and really don't know how that is going to turn out in the long run. It seemed for a while there well, like it was going to be no big deal. We, we shut the economies down by flipping the switch, and we just flipped, it, we flipped, the, flipped the switch right back on, and everything seemed to come right back to life. And then that was sort of the expectation. And then the contrary expectation was that, okay, if something bad was going to happen, if that was all just an illusion, that illusion would be revealed right away in 2022. We would see the illusion for what it was, and we started to. That's the thing. 2022 started to look like, okay, this was, this was going to be pretty bad. And then it's been just kind of slowly, seemingly settling in in the same place. But we keep coming back to these underlying fundamentals, which have not changed. Income fundamentals, most of all. In fact, the income fundamentals continue to get worse, which I think, Steve, is reflected in these credit card delinquencies number, delinquency numbers. There's really two problems, right? The one part is that the incomes are getting weak, and so it's becoming difficult to pay off the credit cards. And the other thing the Philly Fed said was, 
more people are falling back and using their credit cards because they don't have the income. And that sort of leads to the downward spiral. Yeah, that's absolutely, Jeff, because we saw in Citibank's earnings today, they said the same thing. In fact, they like credit card usage was up. And I'm like, oh, that's not a good sign because it tells us that people are not keeping up with inflation at a time when we hear from all these political and banking elites that say, look, but average hourly earnings are going up. Can't you see it? It's like, yeah, but my hours worked are going down. Can't you see it? My paycheck is shrinking relative inflation. And so consumers are drawing up their credit cards again, not a good sign. And you kind of mentioned this delinquency rate being the fact that people can't keep up with their payments. You're right. There's a second factor too, is that people get on unemployment and we see the continued claims data hovering, we'll say around 1.8 million. What a lot of people don't understand, Jeff, is when you initially get on unemployment, you probably have some savings. I mean, most people tend to have something and they have the belief that, hey, you know what? I lost my job, but I'm gonna get another one. The problem that starts to occur is, when they don't get another one, and then they say, well, maybe in another month or two, and that doesn't happen either. Next thing you know, your savings are exhausted and you have no choice. You've got to pay rent. You've got to put food on the table. Well, that means something doesn't get paid. The credit cards are one of the first things to go. And that's why we're seeing these delinquency rates likely to keep increasing. That's not a good sign because all it means is that consumers are going to start spending less. And if they spend less, magically inflation is going to go down and more people are going to lose their job. And you start to see that, yes, indeed, this is the beginning stages of the game. No, we're close to the end. It's, we get back to the banking system, too, because the banks are a huge part of everything here, not only in extending credit, but also they're telling us what they're actually seeing in terms of loan originations and all the information they get from people that are that are asking for loans. And if banks are actively saying we're a little bit shy about giving loans here, as we've seen in the SLUS data, but also the Philly Fed had some numbers about that too. Banks are becoming increasingly risk averse. That's also information that we need to be aware of because they're saying at the margins of the economy, which is what we're really talking about, there are too many people who are already struggling. They're now struggling even worse to the degree that they're falling further and further behind. Let me read you one other thing from the Philly Fed report that goes along with what I'm saying. And this is about mortgages. Now, you know, the housing market seems like it has restarted all over again. The idea that rate cuts are, are, are in the future, and I think they are. And so people are piling into houses again. Well, the banking system is looking at the incomes and saying, maybe not. According to Philly Fed, mortgage originations were the lowest in the series. Again, going back to 2012, originated mortgages hint at a possible change in the risk approach of firms. While credit scores remain steady, median original front end debt to income and loan to value are elevated compared with the fourth quarter of 2021. So what they're saying is that banks are saying, yeah, we need to tighten up and we're actively tightening up here. And this is the fourth quarter of last year. As you mentioned, Steve, is when we saw a lot of things begin to change. A lot of things really did. And remember back in the fourth quarter, even the Fed said, well, we think something's changing, so we'll start talking about rate cuts. And now, of course, they backed off of that because of oil prices. But lots of things go back to the fourth quarter, which I like the analogy that you brought up. That, that The game hasn't been going on for the last two years. It seemed like it started in 2022, but this, the, 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 the first pitch wasn't really until maybe the fourth quarter of last year. No, Jeff, because I think people are going back to the what was looking like a global recession going into the pandemic, which there was. There was indeed a global slowdown. The Fed was cutting rates. And so they said, OK, the game started. And well, it did. Then. I mean, we were in the early stages of going into recession. The pandemic hits. But in their mind, they just think it's one continuous thing. What they don't realize is the pandemic did get us out of recession. The problem is it didn't fix the underlying problems with the economy, which is something you've been saying for years that didn't actually work. And now, all of a sudden, as soon as the pandemic money's gone, everyone's like, well, the game is still being played. It's like, no, 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 you don't understand. That game ended. Maybe it had a rain delay or got washed out, but you missed it. It's a new game now. And we can look at what we talked about last week. You know, we talked about oil prices and the danger of that. What did we see in the University of Michigan survey today for consumer sentiment? Oil prices starting to bite. 
becoming a problem, consumers having an issue with higher gas prices. We talk about lending. Wells Fargo and their earnings today, Jeff, you know what they said is that demand for loans. Now, it's not them just tightening because we know that they're doing that. The SLUS report's telling us that. But they said demand from consumer for, for consumers and businesses is down. They're paying off their old loans rather than taking new loans. So you're seeing it. Everyone's saying, look, the system is tight. Financial conditions are tight. Rates are too high. Meanwhile, of course, the Fed's got their head sky high up here saying, hey, you know what? We might even have to hike rates again. But we know the stress of the system is getting worse. Yeah, if things continue to move in this direction where the incomes actually do continue to slow down in nominal terms, and of course, oil prices continue to, 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 to really impact consumers' ability to spend on not just I mean, they're going to buy oil price. They're going to buy oil. They don't buy oil. They're going to buy gasoline. They're going to continue to pay at the pump, but it just leaves less and less and less for other things, including paying off your credit card. So the more oil prices and the longer oil prices go up before they come back down again, which they're going to do, the worse it's going to be on the other side. And we keep coming back to this. And you just mentioned it, Steve. There is a non-trivial chance that, um, the pandemic period left us worse off than when we started in 2019. You think about where things were, they were not good in 2019, but in 2019, a lot of people, they felt like they were keeping up. They felt like, okay, it's, it's maybe it's not like the boom periods used to be before 2008, but at least uh, things seem generally stable. And that's, that's something you can't really discount in 2024. It's the complete opposite. More people feel that they've been left behind than maybe ever before, at least certainly in, in recent memory. And that's after going through the great financial crisis, which wasn't financial, in 2008. And there's some truth to that. That's what we're really getting at here. This is not just a bunch of people whining because they don't like gasoline prices. There is some real truth to the fact that for all that has happened over the last several years, it hasn't actually been able to cover up that initial error, the pandemic and the lockdowns and everything else. It was enough for a little while to make it look like everything was fine, but now we're all struggling to see, was it really fine? And that that process of evaluation and actually the process of reversion in the real economy has been ridiculously drawn out for all the reasons that we're citing. And it com we keep coming back to that original premise. Can we have a soft landing and a booming economy that comes afterward, given everything that we've seen up to this point? People are really suffering. Well, the ending was yours. I, I was leaving the ending for you. That's why I was saying I'm, I'm oh, done. I, 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 I was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> well, I was looking I at the clock. I, thought, oh, I was crap, looking at the clock and wrong. I was like, go ahead. And I'm like, maybe you should end it because I, I got nothing more. <laughs>